Okay, well, let me see if I can get started with this. It seemed to me that I'm talking to an uh, audience of rather well-educated people, uh, many of who have had some exposure to biodynamics and have some curiosity about it, and who, as far as I can tell, are pretty much all interested in agriculture that works. And I distinguish this from the agriculture that's going on today on a very large scale because it's rapidly hitting the wall because it doesn't work. It's in a war with nature. And if you want to engage in war with nature, go ahead, but guess who wins? So, I got into biodynamics because I was keenly interested in growing food of the highest quality. And so when I uh, started off on that particular journey, one of the things that happened, sort of a culmination of this process, was I went to the research station near the town where I was farming. Blairsville, Georgia, and I talked to the scientists there and I told them that I wanted to become a farmer and grow food of the highest quality. And I knew, because I had studied chemistry, that if I used these crude salt fertilizers on the soil, it would slam the chemical equilibrium up against the wall in the soil and the plants, and there would be no way I could possibly grow high quality that way. So what did I need to do? And the first thing they said, they looked at each other and said, well, we'd like to help you, Mr. Lovell, but we don't know what to tell you. And then the next thing they said was, we don't even have a way to measure quality. And I thought, gee, that's peculiar because every chef from coast to coast knows how to tell quality. And he does it with his nose and his tongue. And I hearkened back to the first lecture in my first chemistry course in my biochemistry curriculum in the university where the professor had started our class with this statement. He said, you have two of the best methods of chemical analysis that have ever been developed that you carry around with you at all times, taste and smell. And that was the very first statement in the first chemistry course I took in my curriculum. And so I really thought it very peculiar that the scientists at our experiment station had no way to determine quality. I think in the world today, with all of the cooking shows on television and all the rest of this, that there has been a sort of an elevation of the awareness of the general public in food of quality. So hopefully at this time I'm talking to an audience that has already been primed for the kind of message that I wish to deliver. Now, some very interesting things happened along my journey in trying to find out how to grow food of the highest quality because the first thing that happened was I asked farmers up and down the road and they assured me that uh, the piece of land that I was trying to farm, which I was going to try farming the best piece of land that I had available to me, which it wasn't very good. And they said, well, you'll have to use chemical fertilizer. And so I looked around to see what crop I could grow that used the least amount of chemical fertilizer, <coughs> and that turned out to be syrup sorghum. And I grew a crop of syrup sorghum, and because of my experience in the field of chemistry, I knew good and well that I didn't want to use any of those chemicals on growing uh, any crop. And so I grew this crop of sorghum, and at the end of it all, when we'd made syrup out of it, I could tell that the soil had been so severely set back, it was in much worse condition at the end of that year than at the start. And I thought, 
well, I can't farm this way. And I resolved to put my best land into a cover crop and hold it in reserve and figure out how to farm by trying to farm my worst land. And it was very fortunate on this farm because it had an abundance of very bad land. It was one of the most serious cases of soil erosion and environmental devastation in the county. And that was extremely fortunate because if I had started with good land and proceeded to run it down, then I would have never found out how to build it up. It would have taken too long. It generally, in our agricultural practices today, we're taking good land and running it down. And it is very resilient and it takes a long time. And so people are passing land down to their grandchildren and it's still farmable by these very bad methods. So I was fortunate and because it was my aim, sometimes our intention comes out in very strange ways. It's kind of like having your prayers answered. Well, that first year, that winter, I prayed to find out what I needed to know to grow food of the highest quality. And at that time, this young lady over here was my next door neighbor. And she gave me a book called the Pfeiffer Garden Book, which I read during the winter. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but it wasn't nonsense either. And so then that spring occurred and I was out around my apple trees working and she came scooting down the road in her automobile and pulled up to a stop in a cloud of dust and hopped out and said, Peter Richards, at my <coughs> farm today. And I said, fine, who's Peter Richards? And she said, oh, he's a biodynamic farming consultant. And blah, blah. He's an expert about apples and so forth. I was out at my apple trees. And so I says, oh, all right. Well, I'll come up as soon as I finish what I'm doing. So I did. I walked up the hill to her house. And here was Peter Escher, who is this sort of, like about this tall, a sort of little Swiss gnome of a guy. He was hunchbacked and had arthritic claw-like fingers and roomy eyes. And I thought, gee, this guy is really ancient. And uh, <laughs> so I asked him, I says, well, Peter, you know, good to meet you. Uh, what would have made one of my apple trees just break <coughs> out and fall over as it's leaping out? And he said something that caught me totally unaware. I would have never heard it out of the mouths of any of the agricultural advisors available to me uh, uh, on the government payroll. He said, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't have heard that one. And he said, let's go see. And I wouldn't have heard that one. And I thought, gee, you know how old this guy is? If he's been doing that, there's no telling what he knows. So I thought, well, man, I got the real deal. So, <laughs> so I said, yeah, so let's. And we went down there, Charlie came with us, and we turned the corner on the field, and he said, you've plowed this too wet, and you sowed your grain too thick, he says, and you used too much raw manure. And I thought, how could he tell that? That was looking at a distance. Yeah, yeah, he was a field, and I says, how could you tell? And he picked up a dirt clod, and he threw it and hit another dirt clod, and neither one of them broke, and he said, you see? And he whipped off some of the cereal rye that was growing there, and it was limp as a dish rag. It was all lodged in the field. And he said, you see? And he looked at it real close. Now, I had training in psychology, and I knew that observation was the basis of intelligence. And this guy is showing me that he's observed this from a distance. And I looked real close, and it was speckled with little specks. And I said, what's that? And he says, I don't know. He says, but it doesn't belong there. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and I thought, oh, wow. So we walked along, and in the highest spot in the field, he stood there, and he looked all the way around, 360 degrees, looking at the, the tree line, the periphery. 
And finally he said, you need stinging nettle. And he said, dig a hole here. Shabari had this little army bowling shovel. So I started digging with it. It wasn't very apt for digging. So uh, I, I kind of like sounded him out and he said, well, you, you need to dig a much bigger hole. So I ran off and got a real shovel and started digging with that. And I dug a hole about as deep as this table is high and about this big around. And he leaned down into it and he looked at the soil and he took some of it like this and he smelled it and he tasted it. And I knew taste and smell, now that's the best methods. So uh, I thought, wow, this is a real observer. And he says, well, he says, you'll never need uh, potassium. And I said, how could you tell? Well, he's mushed it around on his palm like this and it's full of mica. And he said, you see that? He says, that's got potassium in it. And he says, you've got enough potassium here to last almost forever. And so we're looking around, and now the potassium on my soil test that, that the uh, uh, county agent did said, oh, you have to put NPK fertilizer, you know, 10, 10, 10. Uh, so they were advising me to put potassium on it, but this this old fellow said, "You know, we'll never we'll never need potassium on this land." And it turns out he was right. But he knew, he really truly knew, and so he we went from there, and he said, "What's going on over here?" And I went over there with him, and I explained what I thought I was doing, and. He didn't have any signs of approval. And I said, well, that's good, isn't it? And he said, no, that's bad. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, explain to me what's bad about it. And so he explained, and then we went on, and he says, what's over there? What's going on there? And I went over there, and I explained what that was. And every time I said, that's good, isn't it? He said, no, that's bad. And I said, please, be, you know, please explain what's bad about it. And he would do that. And we went all over my farm and it got too dark to see anymore. And finally we had to go in. And this was a, a real old hunchbacked guy. And he had a gleam in his eye and boy, he wouldn't quit. He was Pfeiffer's and partner. <clears throat> he was Aaron Fried Pfeiffer's, uh, I guess you'd say business partner, okay? He financed Pfeiffer's farm and laboratories in, uh, in New York, in Spring Valley, New York. And <clears throat> he had himself been a market gardener. He migrated after World War II and been a market gardener on some very poor land in New Jersey. I found this out much later. And it was a real training ground for him because like the federal piece of land I was farming, anything he did wrong showed up right away. You just couldn't do something bad to something that was already flat on its back and not notice. So there I was, I was very fortunate to have a piece of land that was so devastated that it couldn't get much worse. And so I spent many years. I farmed there for 30 years. And by the end of that time, now Peter was my first real introduction to biodynamics. And uh, so I kind of built on that. The first thing I did was I bought something called Dr. Pfeiffer's Field Spray. And I put Dr. Pfeiffer's Field Spray on an acre, and I put raw manure on another acre in the same field, just a two acre field, and I plowed this under and planted it in a cover crop of cereal rye and clover. And I put molybdenum on the seed to treat the seed, and I put borax in the, in the uh, field, I spread it, because these were deficient elements in the soil. And where I had sprayed the Dr. Pfeiffer's field spray, the next summer, when I turned that rye in, 
the soil was brown and crumbly. And I didn't remember it that way. I thought it was pretty pale and gummy. And uh, I thought, gee, this is, this is better soil than I thought. And my next door neighbor across the road who loaned me this book called The Secret Life of Plants, he looked at it and he says, gosh, you, he says, you could grow carrots in this land. You know, it's really brown, crumbly soil. I couldn't remember it being that way. But on the other part, when I got back to that part and plowed in the other direction and turned it over, it was still pale gummy clay. And I got down off the tractor and I walked the whole length of the furrow and tried to find signs of the manure and couldn't even find it. And I continued to plow and the part that had the field spray, which cost $10 and took me a couple hours to put it out, uh, it was brown and crumbly. And the part that I put the raw manure on was still a pale gummy clay and I could, on a few places I could find a, a remnant or so of the manure. So I planted it in soybeans after the rye. And it came up in the part that had the Dr. Pfeiffer's field spray, the prettiest field of soybeans. Excuse me, in what bean preps are in the Pfeiffer field spray? Uh, in the Pfeiffer field spray, there's a complex of the bean preps. Uh, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer was what you might call a biodynamic heretic. Uh, he was Steiner's uh, uh, right-hand uh, apprentice, you might say, in learning biodynamics. And so he felt he knew enough about it to violate the rules, I guess. Uh, so he mixed these preparations all together. And the other practitioners, they were spraying them individually, and they only had certain ways they could do it. But he, he actually made this up in a medium that was based on cow manure and that he put these preparations into it as homeopathic potencies. And then you could take this material and moisten it overnight, stir it up with water. I stirred it up for a whole hour, this way and that way. And then I sprayed it on the land. I actually tried to spray it through a sprayer and it kept getting stuck in the sprayer. I didn't screen it which that was a learning experience just on the techniques of farming. You, you, if you're spraying anything in farming, you strain it every time. Otherwise, you're getting down off your tractor and unblocking spray nozzles and all this sort of stuff. But I had learned the hard way. And so in that process, then I was putting out all of the biodynamic preparations except the horn silica. That was not in the uh, Dr. Pfeiffer's field spray. Uh, there's no telling what the orthodox biodynamic people threw at, at Pfeiffer for breaking the rules like that. But Pfeiffer was looking at the imperative that Rudolf Steiner sort of laid on him that the most important thing was to get the benefits of these preparations applied to the widest possible areas of the entire earth for its healing and for the improvement of its produce in every respect. So uh, Pfeiffer thought, well, if we had to do these things one at a time and we do them this you know, very pedantic way, well then it'll never get there. So he made it easy that farmers who didn't know anything about it could mix it up and spray it on there and then they'd get the effects. And the effects were so profound because in that area that I'd sprayed with nothing but the Dr. Pfeiffer field spray, I had the prettiest field of soybeans and it set four pods to the nose. On the other side where I had put the cow manure, it grew, it grew 10 feet tall weeds and you could not find the soybean. And that was 40 times harder and 40 times more expensive and it didn't get me any soybeans at all. So that was the first experience that I had in using biodynamics. <coughs> and it was so profound an experience. I got such a, a like, almost picture book result where I'd used the preparations and I got 
the hells of modern agriculture over on the other side. Weeds that were 10 feet tall and you couldn't find a single representative of the crop you planted. Uh, so it was, yeah, that was, I thought, gee, I gotta find out more about this. Not a very hard conclusion to come to. So, <laughs> so I did, I, I, I worked away at it and I, I made lots of mistakes. I've sort of had a talent in life of making mistakes. And so I learn a lot that way. If you don't make mistakes, you're not going to learn much of anything. So uh, that was just sort of my natural gift. So in practicing biodynamics, I've made lots of mistakes. And one of the reasons that I've been so good at making mistakes is I've tried all sorts of different things. If I just got stuck in a rut, well then I probably wouldn't have learned so much. So I'm amongst those people that sometimes get identified as biodynamic heretics. Because uh, if there's anything orthodox about what I do, well then I try to break those rules. My dad told me that rules are made to be broken. My dad taught me to think for myself also. Uh, but on the one with the rules are made to be broken, there was an occasion shortly thereafter where I broke the rules and he said, not this rule and not this time. And <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, okay. Let's see if we can get just a, a little introduction to this subject because biodynamics sorts of, sort of eludes you on how it works. Because it doesn't work like uh, it doesn't work like a diesel engine, you know. <coughs> it doesn't follow on that this, you know, the laws of of Newton, Newtonian mechanics. It it really doesn't fit that paradigm. Uh, it really fits a different paradigm, and that's why I, I call this quantum agriculture, because Newtonian physics went out the window with the uh, discovery of quantum physics. Newtonian physics was based on a belief system that the phenomena and the observer were entirely separate and didn't influence one another. And biodynamics is based on a paradigm, it's called Goethean epistemology, after Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And good to believe that the observer and the phenomena are inseparably linked. And that that paradigm came to the fore with Heisenberg's principle of indeterminacy and the birth of quantum physics because Heisenberg proved that the very presence of the observer and his or her measuring instruments are a determining factor in the field of investigation. And if you look for the wave behavior of a particle, you'll find the wave behavior, but you won't know where the particle is. But if you look for the location of the particle, then you lose sight of what the wave behavior is. So, so it all depends on what you look for as to what you find. Uh, Schrodinger, who later on in, the, in 1948 delivered a course on biophysics, and his lectures on biophysics pointed out that living organisms have the remarkable ability to concentrate a stream of order on themselves, and thus they defy what's called the second law of thermodynamics. So instead of losing their energy and it dispersing and becoming unavailable, which is what the second law of thermodynamics says everything does, then living organisms do the opposite. They draw energy into themselves and they produce greater complexity and greater order within their parameters. Now, Rudolf Steiner, who introduced the basic material that has come down to us as biodynamic agriculture, said in his lectures, it is of the greatest importance that living organisms have an inside 
and an outside. Now that wasn't too clear maybe back in 1924 what he was talking about if you were a physicist. What did that mean, you know? Uh, he started his first lecture on agriculture talking about the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars in the universe and how these cosmic influences uh, had such great importance in the world of agriculture. And to me, because I had studied quantum physics, and I had realized that astrology is valid if you do the mathematics. The mathematics is not what you're doing if you read your horoscope in the newspaper because it says a cancer and it doesn't say anything about the time and place you were born. It just says cancer, this is what's gonna happen. And it's, it is, I think, astrology for people with weak minds. But if you, were to actually do the mathematics. I was taking astrophysics at the same time that I took quantum physics, and that's what made me realize that the universe is coherent. And if that's true, if, if quantum non-locality, quantum entanglement, if these things are something that are happening throughout the universe no matter where you are, then, wait a minute, then astrology has to be valid. And so for me, that was a sort of a, an epiphany that happened to me in my scientific education before I ever heard of, of biodynamics. So when I read Steiner's agriculture course and the first lecture was about how the sun, moon, and planets are so great an influence on things, then I thought, oh wow, this is real scientific agriculture. And if I, told that to most people without a little explanation, then they would, they would think surely I was off my nut. But what's going on in the world of plants and animals and whatnot is plants are taking in carbon dioxide and sunlight and turning that into sugar and building up energy. Now, what chaos theory shows us is that it's not a theory about whether there's chaos. There's chaos. But the theory in chaos theory is why in the world does order arise out of chaos? Because undeniably, order does arise out of chaos under certain circumstances. And what are these circumstances? It's very difficult to pinpoint where and why it arises because, well, we get into the butterfly effect and we get into what's called a strange attractor. It's very strange because you can't locate it. But nonetheless, it does occur at boundaries. Boundaries give rise to order. So order arises at boundaries. In permaculture, this is called the edge effect. And it's a well-recognized principle without any scientific explanation in permaculture. But it's undeniably true, and you can see it, and you can demonstrate it. But in biodynamic agriculture, Steiner was saying it's of the greatest importance that living organisms have an inside and an outside. And what is that? That's a boundary. And order arises at boundaries. So the influences of the surroundings are coming to bear on the skin or cell wall or the bark or leaf of the tree, whatever it is, and order is arising there. And plants are doing this thing called photosynthesis. Well, animals sort of do the opposite of that. So plants are building up these organic structures, and animals are digesting them. Now, a plant actually depends on the nutrients that it takes up from its roots. And it depends on nitrogen fixation and digestion of the nitrogen fixers taking place around its roots where it's giving off these sugary root exudates. It's depending on that to give it the nitrogen that it needs for cell division and for growth. 
So it's dependent on digestion. Protozoa are one-celled animals, and they're providing the nitrogen that the tree needs to grow. And it's actually coming from outside the plant. But as an animal, what we do as animals is we take what we're going to get our nitrogen from, we take it into our digestive system, and we break down its proteins into amino acids and absorb it from the inner core of our being. So an animal is sort of like, takes what the plant is doing and takes the cosmos, the surrounding influences that provide the nutrient for the plant, and it takes them inside, so it's getting the whole cosmos it feeding it from its inside. And so the animal, in this fashion, gets the benefit of nitrogen. Now why is that so important? Well, in the periodic table, nitrogen is the most sensitive element in the periodic table. It is the first anion in the periodic table, and it's triple negative, so it's looking for three more electrons out there to pair with in order to satisfy its need to have eight electrons in its outer shell, which is an extremely stable configuration for some reason called in physics the octave rule. So to achieve that state, nitrogen is sensitive to the changes going on with electrons throughout the universe. So the electron flux of the universe which is kind of like the magnetic field, which is universal, or the gravitic field, which is universal, but we don't think of electricity as having a universal field, but it does. And nitrogen is sensitive to this and knows what's going on everywhere in the universe. And what Julia said about all of these plants and things being sentient, well, they are, because they are working with nitrogen. So the plant is sensitive to its surroundings, but the animal actually takes this sensitivity inside and embodies it. So the animal is actually sensitive from within of its surroundings outside of itself. So we actually internalize the awareness. The plant doesn't embody it, doesn't internalize it. But those nitrogen processes that are working on the plant from its surroundings are working on the animal from its interior. And so we're actually able to have consciousness, to have sensitivity, and to have desire. And desire, you might say, is a part of that sentience. So as animals, we can pick and choose what we're going to eat, and we can say, oh, I like that, I desire it, so I'll have it. And so, oh, I don't like that, I won't have it. And so nitrogen has this character as an element in the periodic table. Ordinarily, nitrogen cannot find anything else to pair with to share electrons that is anywhere near as sentient and as clever and as desirous as itself. So it's in a love affair with itself. It's the most narcissistic, narcissistic. narcissistic element in the periodic table. And so it behaves as an inner gas in the atmosphere. And it's one of the realizations, there are many that underpin biodynamics, but one of the realizations in biodynamics that I never find anywhere else in agriculture is that it takes something very craven and desirous to sort of uh, seduce nitrogen away from its love affair with itself, and that is lime. Now, I've worked as a cement finisher, and we're pouring decks on bridges and things like that. And you get a little cement down your shirt. You stop everything and you clean up. Because if you don't, it will eat you up. It'll actually eat your skin off and eat into your flesh. 
Uh, if you have a dead animal and you're putting it on your compost heap or something, if you'll salt it down with a little quicklime, it'll help it dissolve really quickly. Uh, it's uh, Lime has this nature. We use it for plaster, we use it for cement, for mortar mix. Uh, it has that sort of nature. If you want to mix them all your corn, then you can take powdered lime and cook up your corn with it, and it'll take the outer husk off of it. And in that process, it activates the vitamin B3, and it uh, will uh, insulate you from getting uh, vitamin B3 deficiency disease. I believe that's called flagra. That the Native Americans knew because they lived on corn, but some of the settlers that uh, started to live on corn without nixtamoling it died of flagra. Anyway, the process that's going on with lime is lime attaches itself to everything. But silica, which is its opposite, it doesn't attach itself to anything. You know, <coughs> what holds onto the sand on the beach? The water, nothing, nothing really holds on. It just, you know, sand is the most generous and giving of all of the things out there. So it's really the opposite of lime. What you see in the physiology of a cell is you see the silica in the cell walls. You see the lime in the nucleus of the cell. So you see them at the opposite extremes of the, of the physical structures of a single cell. And what do you see in the human being? Your skin, your hair, your fingernails are rich in silica. Your bones are rich in lime. So this, this is a consistent thing that's taking place in nature. That lime has that characteristic of lying at the center of things. And silica lies at the periphery. So when we're talking about the forces of the periphery, then they're working through silica. When we're talking about the forces of the center, they're working with lime. So what happens with lime? Lime is a sedimentary rock. Lime settles on lake bottoms and whatnot. It precipitates and it goes flat. It goes horizontal. Silica rises up. This is what pushes up high mountains like the Himalayas. Uh, is the silica is pushing up from within, so it's going like this. Silica cooks up out of the Earth's mantle. This is what holds the continents afloat. So the silica in the Earth's mantle that's cooking up is actually pushing up these wrinkles in the continent that are mountains. So it's actually pushing them up. It's going like this all the time. This is what silica is doing. It's shooting out of volcanoes. So here's silica and its activity in our environment. Here is lime and its activity in our environment. And they're doing the opposite things. They do this in plants. Silica is the basis of the transport system in plants, in the xylem cells of a plant but picks up the fluid and carries it upward into the plant in utter defiance of gravity is what we call capillary reaction. And that is a function of silica. What is a capillary tube that we show this to, you know, science students? It's a little glass tube. So the capillary reaction is working through silica. But what produces nitrogen fixation in the soil is the root exudation. It takes 10 units of sugar to fix one amino acid. It's a very energetic process. You have to engage the nitrogen and it doesn't engage very readily. So you have to put some energy into it. But the lime, the digestive properties and everything that are taking place, it's working with what falls downward into the soil from the plant. So the nitrogen fixation that's going on in feeding the plant is a soil process that's associated with lime 
whereas the photosynthesis that's taking place up in the leaf is a silica process. These are the two basic biodynamic remedies, preparation. Yes, well, that's right. When you get into biodynamic preparations, and you've got the horn manure and the horn silica, then the horn manure is the preparation that is used to enhance, or to, you might say, invoke the lime processes in the soil. Whereas the horn silica preparation is used to enhance or invoke the silica processes, which, when it comes to growing things, are occurring in the atmosphere. Now, what silica and light and warmth do in the winter in the soil is a little more obscure, and I would rather not try to get off that far into an explanation, but there are plenty of explanations if you ever have the time for them. There's an article on our website, What Happens in Winter? That's, that will take your thought into areas that you didn't ever dream of. <laughs> now, one of the things that's going on, see, you have to catch carbon by photosynthesis. Have, the plant has to be making sugar before it can feed those processes that fix nitrogen, that take nitrogen out of the air. And really, the, the humus in the soil is what primes the pump for the plant. You know, if you've got a well and you're trying to get water out of it and you can't get it to work, you have to put a little water in before you can get water out. Well, that's the sort of thing that's happening with fertile soils. The humus is the energy flywheel that feeds the activity that gets the plant going so the plant can actually make sugar and then, uh, and then fix nitrogen. Now, some of our plants, like our crop plants, generally have this sort of energy package that they have with them. You know, you plant a seed of wheat and it's a rather, it's a small kernel, but it's rather fat. And it's got a lot of energy in the cotyledon. So when that wheat seed sprouts, then before the root ever emerges, the enzyme processes are breaking down the starches into sugar, and they're leaking out of the seed. And if you sprout this without rinsing it for a few days, then it'll turn sour. So you rinse it actually to wash the root exudates away from the sprout. If you're sprouting corn, you need to do this uh, maybe more like three or four times a day because you get so much more root exudate out of a corn kernel. If you're sprouting soybeans or any large seed, then you have to rinse it more often because it's giving off richer root exudation. But that's the energy that it's feeding to the soil microbiology. And the soil microbiology like says, oh wow, there's this food over there, let's go get it. And so these plants with their food package with them, the seed sprouts and it's giving off a signal to the partners that it wants to associate with and they come running to the feast. And those are actually the, the symbiotes of the plant. So each plant in the flavor of its root exudations is inviting its community of helpers to help it grow. Does that mean that we shouldn't chip seeds uh, before we sow? We shouldn't what? Chip seeds before we sow them. Start them off. My beans, I always start my beans off so that the plumules come out and it's growing before I cut them in. Well, I don't know that it says that because it, it would take, like if you started it off, depends on what you're sowing it into, I don't know. But if you were sowing it in sand that maybe it would need to get a little head start, then maybe you do need to start it, but it'll keep giving off root exudates for a while. Mm -hmm. So just think how big a bean seed is, and it's gonna be giving off root exudates, even though it'll send the cotyledons up above ground, it's still going to be giving off stuff from its roots out of those cotyledons for a week or two at least. So I don't really know how, how, like, I wouldn't ordinarily do that with bean seeds, but maybe under certain conditions you would, I don't know. 
different, it's cold outside, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And if it starts, you give it, starts it off, then take that one. Yeah, well, then it gets going and it's not going to stop. Yeah. So maybe if it was, the soil was too cold, you'd have to get it started first. Yeah. That might be a good reason to do that. Could, could I just add one thing? Yeah. When I used to walk by Q's farm, and I would say, oh, your soil's looking so lovely, so wonderful, and he'd always say, and the atmosphere. And oh, I yes. think that is one of the major distinctions of biodynamic agriculture and quantum agriculture is the atmosphere. That we are farming the atmosphere also. Yeah, we tend to forget this. And okay. that's the whole quantum <coughs> part of it that Steiner recognized the silica process. Yeah, this well, process let's, let's, let's take a look at that, okay? okay because photosynthesis is not a process that takes place in the soil. Just think about it. It's taking place in the atmosphere. Blossoming is not a process that takes place in the soil. It takes place in the atmosphere. Fruiting is not a process that takes place in the soil. It takes place in the atmosphere. And ripening is another thing like that. But in the soil, we have certain processes that aren't taking place in the atmosphere. And these would be mineral release and nitrogen fixation and digestion and nutrient uptake. So what grows a plant is not simply what's going on in the soil. Yes, the soil provides support for the plant, and it provides that initial like uh, array of nutrition that gets it started. And it's the home for these microbes that are the plant symbiotes, and just a whole bunch of things that are going on in the soil down below the surface that are essential to the growing plant. But what's going on above the surface is also essential to the growing plant. And that's where the plant is making its sugars and doing all its chemistry in the leaf. And then that sap that leaks down and out of the roots of the plant at night is feeding those uh, biological processes that take place around the plant in the soil. And we tend to think that what's going on in the universe around us is all streaming into us like from above. But that wouldn't be true either. What's actually taking place on the planets beyond the sun and the moon, sun and the earth rather, there are planets between the sun and the earth, and that would be Mercury and Venus and the moon. And there are planets beyond the Sun and the Earth, and that's Mars and Jupiter and Saturn. And the influences of Mars and Jupiter and Saturn are actually coming up through the plant, out of the soil, out of the depths of the Earth. They're coming up and streaming towards the Sun in the daytime. And the influences of Mercury and Venus and the Moon are actually reflected onto the earth and are soaking into the earth from the atmosphere. So what we see as digestion, which is a mercury process, is actually soaking into the earth. You've got cows or sheep or something else like that out here on your pasture. Where does it manure? It doesn't bury its manure. It lets the manure, with digestive processes, it lets them work into the earth. All the insects that are digesting your plants that weren't healthy enough to, to stand up for themselves, then those insects in digesting the plant are manuring on the earth. And that's soaking into the earth. And there are leaching processes that keep on carrying it down into the earth. One of the things I learned from a Belgian who was a homeopath that migrated to uh, Georgia. And I was out with him and he's spreading compost on his garden and he's scattering it on the surface. And he was growing a great garden in this like heavy red clay uh, in South Georgia. And it was obvious from looking at his garden that he knew what he was doing. 
And he said, oh no, he says, I never work it in more than an inch or two. And that sort of woke me up because I found that I had previously, I'd been working compost into the soil and that actually didn't work as well. If I put the compost on the surface and maybe scratched it in a little bit or put a little mulch on top, then it worked into the soil. And here's what would happen. You have to watch closely. I would have those animals in the soil, many of them smaller than you can see, they would come up and feed off of that compost and they would carry it back down to get away from the sunshine in the daytime. They would carry that back down and they would go around the roots in the plant. So they would go where the soil biology is richest, which would be in the root exudate zone of the plant, and they would manure it there. They would take what they ate from the compost, they'd come up there for a certain kind of a snack and they'd go down again and get a different kind of a snack. And so they'd cycle like this. They'd drink dew at night when it was, when it was dry as, you know, and we didn't have any rain for a month. Then they came up and they drank dew, and they went and peed on the roots of the plant during the day. It was very, very important to put the compost on the surface and let that process work. Then the plants were much healthier. If I mixed the compost into the soil, here's what happened. The compost then would be breaking down in the soil. And the amino acids in the compost would be released there in the soil. And in the, in the watery component of the soil, they would oxidize to nitrates and the plant would take up nitrates. If the plant takes up its nitrogen as nitrates instead of freshly digested amino acids, which would, would happen if it came up, if the animal came up and ate the compost <coughs> and then excreted it around the plant's roots, then the plant would take it up as amino acid nitrogen. But if it broke down in the soil and produced nitrates, then the plant took it up as nitrates, and nitrates impaired the photosynthesis at the very same time that they required 10 units of sugar to be converted into <coughs> an amino acid in the leaf. So they poisoned the plant and used up its energy. So it was much more important to put the compost there at the surface and let the animal life in the soil carry it into the plant's roots as amino acids so that then the plant took it up as amino acids and didn't have the burden of having to convert the nitrates back into amino acids. So that sort of thing, I learned this from this Belgian gardener. And it was, I've always known that you watch the people that make things look easy because they know what they're doing. <laughs> so, so I think Julia had some questions about quantum and how we use quantum in our company and in our work with farmers. And I'm given time as well. Well, okay. Maybe you can, can tell me what Quantum, you know, to me, quantum is the way things work out there in nature, really, truly. But we've had a different belief system up until recently. Everything about quantum seems weird, you know, quantum non-locality and entanglement, and, you know, faster than light, and, uh, you know, the, the idea that things can go both forward, forwards and backwards in time, and the, that, uh, yeah, coherence and just all sorts of things that we didn't believe were possible. The reversal of entropy is the big one. Entropy is the idea that the second law of thermodynamics that everything's running down. Uh, yeah, centropy. Yeah, Buckminster Fuller coined, coined that word. Uh, centropy is the opposite of entropy. Centropy is where the complexity runs up. And it's very peculiar to me that we would have the very same scientists who believe that entropy rules everything and it's inviolate, they simultaneously believe in evolution. How could we evolve into more and more complex life forms 
if entropy rules. You know, it, it, they don't seem to see in contradiction, but to me, that's it's a very big contradiction. Let me explain. When I studied science, my first chemistry professor, who was a real genius guy, had been a Jesuit seminarian and fallen in love and gotten married and got his PhD at the age of 23 in organic chemistry and was teaching chemistry in this uh, uh, state university in Louisiana. And anytime you asked him a question, you never got any fewer than two answers. So I learned science as a debate. Now, many people have the experience, they go to school, they learn science, and if you put the wrong answer on the test, well then you fail. And if you even state the answer in a different form than the teacher who taught you was giving it, well then you may flunk. So it's more like a rote memorization process. It's kind of like uh, intellectual regurgitation. So, but that's not how I learned science. Uh, I had a, a calculus professor that he would give calculus tests and if you got a different answer from him on the test and you argued your answer and he says, oh, you're right, then you got double bonus points. So I got that kind of scientific education. Uh, it was learning science as a mystery and learning science as uh, an adventure. Learning science as a great debate. And so I always questioned, and I always like looked for ways to prove myself wrong, or my professors, and that sort of thing. So I was always looking for those contradictions. How can you believe in entropy and believe in evolution at the same time? What a contradiction. So anyway, that's... I think one of the things that we talk about is intent, you know, is how we work with these concepts of quantum in taking our intent and moving them forward. And significantly, the boundary that he was talking about, by say when we work with a farm, we take their map and the farmer has to put the boundaries of their farm that they want to not just have their soil analysis and the and the Pfeiffer total soil testing and all that, but say if we're treating them quantum-wise, they boundary their farm. So this gives, it keeps the inner, you explain to me. I well, well, Steiner put it this way in his agriculture course, that we need to treat our farms as though they are living organisms. Now living organisms have a shell or a cell wall or a skin or whatever have you, they have a boundary. You have to have your boundary around your farm. Just thinking of your farm as having its boundaries is an important exercise. By thinking, look, our, the way we think, this is quantum physics, the way we think, the way we look at our farms determines our farms. We are a determining factor in the field of our investigation and the way we look at our farms determines what our farms will be like. When we look for something, then we will find that. If we look for something else, we will find that. If we look for weeds as a problem, we will never see weeds as a benefit. You know, if we look for for problems in farming, we will have problems. Where the attention goes, the energy flows. Chris Berg, and that's the quantum that, physics. The thing the plants love the most are the footsteps of the farmer. That meant that farmer was out there paying attention, wanting to know, hello fellas, you know. Well, it, there's been all sorts of experiments that show that when you pay attention to a plant, it behaves differently. Now, 
but there's there's experiments with water. There was one fellow here that was very interested in water. Fun. And water is a very interesting substance because the hydrogen atom, look, we're talking about boundaries, right? The hydrogen atom has the most boundary for the smallest volume of any atom in the periodic table. So the ratio of boundary, of surface, you might say, to volume is the greatest with the hydrogen atom. So it is the, the atom in the periodic table that gives rise to order to the greatest degree. You look at water and it has such a memory for patterns. And it can hold patterns. If you, the classic experiment is to take a tub with a central drain and to vortex the water so that you get a vortex and wait a few days and come back and pull the drain out and it will go out the direction that it remembered. Homeopathic medicine is based on this property of water that it will accept a pattern and hold it. It loves order. Water loves order. Is that why water is used as literally a healing medicine? Well, it, it gives rise to order, you yes. know? And it's, if one of the things that we can do in terms of when we've got some illness that maybe we don't have any other way to treat it. it. Used to be when I was a kid, you know, go home, go to bed, drink plenty of water, you know, and see if you don't get over it. If I could give another example. Uh, <laughs> drink <laughs> lots of water. This I is a big medical advice thing. In the Lakota language where I used to study, the word for spirit or God or great spirit is ni, ina. The word for water is ina, mini. So spirit. The next yeah. order of spirit is water. Yeah. And in chiropractic care, disease, a disease is dis-ease. Yes. In other words, it's in balance, lack of yeah. order. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you're looking at, I mean, Steiner was a chemist. Uh, so he was also a mathematician and a biologist, but he was a chemist. And I really loved his agriculture lectures because of their insights into chemistry. So if you're a chemist, then you will love some of these Steiner statements like, nitrogen drags oxygen through the carbon structure, freeing it of its rigidity. Well, that's what your hemoglobin in the blood is, is a big protein. It's a big, like, uh, uh, nitrogen complex. And it, it carries the oxygen through your tissues, and it frees carbon from its rigidity when you're exhaling the carbon dioxide. So nitrogen is dragging oxygen through the carbon structure, freeing it of its rigidity. Well, this is a kind of a poetical way to approach chemistry, but I like it. I don't have any trouble remembering chemistry when I look at it that way, you know? Uh, <laughs> this is, to me, the way that Steiner presented these images of different elements, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and carbon were principal because these elements comprise like 95% or 98% of the human body, okay? If you add sulfur in, it's about 98%. So these elements are what we're made out of. We're made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. And these elements are a free gift of the atmosphere. We're worried about the soil and exhausting the soil and all the rest of that sort of stuff. 
and we're exhausting the soil of these free gifts of the atmosphere. But if we were to conserve them in the soil, then the atmosphere will load them in and keep them going. So in biodynamic agriculture, we're looking at an approach to agriculture that gets away from all of these inputs. We're looking at an approach to agriculture that you quit bringing things in from off the farm. And there's a sort of a rule of thumb in economics. This is true in national economics and it's true in the farm economy. That if you export more than about 8% of your total biomass production from a farm, then you can get yourself in trouble. You become a dependent economy. In other words, the farm that sells its hay all the time is going to impoverish itself. If the farm sells its milk, that's such a small part of its biomass production that it's a very good way to build up fertility in your farm. So, and I see it all the time. I test soils and I work with dairies and every kind of agriculture and the dairy farmers are the ones that are building soil fertility. There's no question of it. They're the ones that have 10 and 20% organic matter in their soils and they have large reserves of energy in their soils. Dairy farmers. The ones that are doing this are the ones that are essentially grass dairying. They're providing most of the inputs for the cows from their pastures. And they're building soils. They're, they're catching carbon and sequestering it. They should get carbon credits. <laughs> There's something about the way we think about these things. Many of our environmentalists think, oh, you have to plant forests in order to catch carbon. Well, that's simply not true. Uh, these dairies are catching carbon. Unquestionably, they're catching many, many, many tons per year and incorporating it into their soils and building soil fertility. Cultivation is one of the best ways to reduce your soil fertility. And beyond that, nitrogen in inputs, like artificial nitrogen inputs, are the second best way to, uh, to reduce your soil fertility. And compaction that follows pretty closely behind that. So with those three things, then we can impoverish our soils. Cultivation, nitrogen inputs, and compaction. We're pressing the life out of our soils. We're keeping the oxygen. Oxygen is the conveyor of dynamics. We talk biodynamics, we're talking about oxygen because oxygen is the element that gives us dynamics. It gives us processes in the soil. Hydrogen gives us the ability to build complexity. It gives us the ability to uh, reverse entropy. Carbon gives us structure. Carbon is, we're all carbon-based life systems, uh, life forms. So carbon is, you might say, the body structure of life. But hydrogen is the spirit of life. And nitrogen is the intelligence. And sulfur is the catalyst. The big farm is good, the best good, because it feeds the soil through the manure and everything else. It's a natural biota in the fields, take the manure down and deal with it. But what you've said is terrible for the wee home garden. Well, we could maybe do better. Some of our gardening methods as home gardeners are not really all that good. We should look at them and, and think twice about them. You know, just because you can dig it up with a fork or a shovel or something else like that doesn't mean that's the best thing to do all the time. Just because you can make compost and load it onto the soil, onto the soil, not into, onto the soil, doesn't mean that you have to do that all the time. 
doesn't mean it's the best thing to do. It doesn't mean that that's the way to grow with the best carrots. Or ginger. Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot of things that we could do in gardening that didn't require all of that, you know? Quite commonly in my gardens, and I was a market gardener, I would take where I had corn or potatoes or squash or whatever have you and sow it down in buckwheat. And then buckwheat was my uh, nurse crop for my winter vegetables. So I could take and plant things like carrots and Chinese cabbage and cabbage and radishes and uh, all sorts of autumn greens and that sort of thing and plant that with buckwheat as a nurse crop. In fact, I, I never could get chamomile to make a stand any other way. To make a bed of chamomile, I had to rake in the buckwheat seed and then scatter the chamomile seed on the top, let the buckwheat get up about like this, mow it off with the lawnmower, and the chamomile would take over. But the, the buckwheat nursed the chamomile. Here it comes up, and its little cotyledons there, and its first leaves and everything, they provided the shade and held the moisture in for the chamomile to sprout. The chamomile would be established. I'd mow it off with a lawnmower, and uh, I'd have a bed of chamomile. And when is the nurse crop? When is the buckwheat sown? Is it then in the autumn? Oh, it could be in late summer. You know, you sow it in late summer, and the buckwheat will come up, and you're providing. Look, think about what weeds are doing. All of these tall woody weeds that give you fits. They are potassium and nitrate collecting weeds. Mm -hmm. They're there, if you don't have loose potassium and nitrate running around because you didn't throw these things out there as soluble materials, then you don't grow those weeds, they don't sprout. So, if you took something that was, say, vegetation sitting on top of the soil in your garden, let's say, and you dug it in and buried it, it's going to break down and it's going to have a bacterial flush. And in that bacterial flush, you will have a lot of nitrogen and potassium will become soluble. And then the first thing that's going to sprout is weeds. But if you took those things and you just pulled them out, put them in your compost pile and raked to the surface without digging all that stuff in, and just raked the surface and planted your buckwheat and then took and laid your, well, in this case, chamomile, you just scatter it on the surface, and then let the buckwheat come up and let the buckwheat, let the chamomile get established, then, wow, you don't have any weeds come up with it because you haven't created the condition for those weeds to sprout. Those weeds are there to do a job and they're going to soak up the loose potassium and nitrate if it's there. If it's not there, they're not going to show up and suck it up. You look at their, at their seeds and they're such tiny seeds, they don't have that, that rich carbohydrate cotyledon to feed the soil biology around their roots. They're depending on those nutrients to be soluble. Because they're not feeding the microorganisms that would make them soluble around their roots. They're going to suck it up out of the soil at large. And if it's not there in the soil at large, only those things with the seed, like a radish seed that has enough, enough of a food package, is going to invite the, the uh, symbiotes that it needs around its... The buckwheat will do that. It's got a, enough of a food package that it invites the microbes that it needs to live with. And the microbes that buckwheat uh, invites are particularly good at solubilizing phosphorus. So it invites the phosphorus solubilizing microbes and it, they proliferate around its roots. 
And then a plant like chamomile that needs that phosphorus for, for blossoming is going to find that environment very helpful once it gets established. We talk mostly about annual production, annual crops. What, what, do you think much about perennials and mycorrhizals? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, of course, if you if you dig up the soil, then you get rid of your mycorrhizal activity in the soil anyway. But yes, I do. If when I garden, all of my paths are perennial. I grow grass, clover, dandelions, plantain, a yarrow, just all sorts of things that I establish and keep growing there as perennials. And so that mycorrhizal activity is always very close to wherever I dig it up for potatoes or whatever. So I've always got that reservoir of, of fungal activity in the soil. And again, it's the border edge effect. That That's right. The, where I dig it up, then the oxygenation of the soil stimulates the mycorrhizae because they're fungi and they are obligate aerobes. They have to have oxygen to really thrive. And if you look at what happens where they thrive the best, they thrive where the ants actually bring the oxygen to the plant, to the fungi. They aerate the soil and the mycelia get going and they, and ants, which are the fungal farmers in the soil, have been found to cultivate up to 30 or 40 different types of fungi in a single ant, ant colony. So they will actually plant and farm the fungi in your soil, in your orchards, and in your pastures. Thank you. Um, my observation is that many biodynamic practitioners are still very fond of tilling soil. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's uh, even a passage where Steiner says something about the cosmic forces coming into the soil when it's being cultivated. Um, and meanwhile, many soil scientists are now telling us how important the mycelium in the soil is. So I'm wondering how you um, parse these things, because I don't think there was really much mention of the um, qualities of mycelium in the biodynamic collection. Uh, I think if you had looked at what Steiner was saying, maybe in regard to orchards or pastures, then he wasn't talking about cultivation at all. But of course, when you're talking about potatoes, then you're talking about cultivation. And uh, so I think you really have to be a more discerning reader. You can't just, just you know, oversimplify things and say, it, you know, the biodynamics is about cultivation. If you don't build soil, then you can't afford to break it down with cultivation. But if you're, if you're cultivating, you're essentially chewing up the soil. And that's a digestive process. And it will release. What will happen then is you will, by killing off the mycorrhiza, you release silica in the soil because it's the mycorrhizae that hold on to the silica and the boron in the soil. And if you want to get a good potato crop, then you want those cosmic forces to get into the potato. So you cultivate and it, you, you release them. But if you keep cultivating that same piece of land over and over, you'll impoverish it. One of the big problems that was taking place at Steiner's time was with the introduction of tractors and steel and so forth into agriculture, then people were doing more cultivation. And the varieties of wheat and whatnot that they were growing at that time would be nice tall plants with long lawns and this sort of stuff, very silica dependent varieties. And as we increasingly use nitrogen fertilizers, which Steiner was definitely showing us a different path of going, as we increasingly did that, then we flushed the silica and the boron out of the soils, and the, the wheat, the barley, etc., then ended up getting diseases. 
And when that happened, then the plant breeders got to work and bred varieties that didn't need so much silica anymore. So now we got weeds that grow this tall and don't have any ones at all. The pattern of plant breeding was introduced by the Green Revolution when the Rockefeller Foundation set up the National Rice Research Institute in Manila to breed the hybrid rice for the Green Revolution. And instead of rices with straws like this, they bred a rice like this that you can pour all the nitrogen fertilizer you wanted to and it didn't fall over. Of course, the quality of the rice and the nutrition of the rice suffered. The thing that gives us the strength to exercise our wills and Steiner's talking about this in his agriculture course. He says the brain is in the process of secreting silicic acid. Silicic acid flows down our nerve channels and it's the basis of our tensing of our muscles. And then the lime element, the magnesium, potassium, etc., has to come back into the muscle tissue for it to relax again. And that's sort of a crude expo uh, exposition of the chemistry of flexing your muscles. So the brain is in the process of secreting silicic acid. Well, if you don't have it in your diet, well, then you're not going to be able to secrete it in the brain very well. And so we're, we're growing a kind of food that doesn't give us the strength of character or the force of personality that we need to do our own thinking and our own activity that comes out of our, Steiner put it this way, to build a bridge between the imagination and the will. You have all sorts of people that you know, think up all sorts of fancy schemes, but they don't have enough follow-through to make it happen. You have some of the uh, most intellectual people think up most uh, the most ideal ideas, and yet they don't manifest anything. And you have people that, uh, you know, maybe the Khrushchevs of this world banging on the table with their shoes that are the actual doers of things. Actually, we have substitute things in these days. It's called Facebook and social media. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's that another that expression that of silica that, that I hadn't thought of. Excuse me, could you say a bit about another aspect of quantum agriculture, which is the electromagnetic side and waves? And yeah, well, the whole idea of quantum physics came about from looking at particles and realizing that the particle nature is one side of the wave nature. That all waves are particles and all particles are waves. The wave is an activity. It's a process. But the particle is a substance. It's, you might say, the wave at rest. So when we're looking at what's going on with phosphorus, we're looking at its process. But when we analyze the soil, then we're looking at the substance. If we were to take a soil sample and analyze it, in the laboratory, first thing we do is screen out all the earthworms. So all the phosphorus that's in the dynamic form in the soil, we'll take it out before we analyze it. So what we're doing in many cases, and I analyze soils all the time, I'm not saying it's stupid or silly to do that, but we're not looking at the process. Now, the thing about analyzing the soil, and Pfeiffer did this on Steiner's advice, was to
to look at the soil and not just look at the soluble phosphorus in the soil, but to look at the total phosphorus. Because if there is a phosphorus process going on in the soil, then the soluble phosphorus is only one part of that because the light can actually work with activating that that's in the total that doesn't show up as soluble phosphorus. And if you analyze some of the world's most fertile native soils that haven't been disturbed, you don't see these high levels of soluble nutrients in them because they're tied up in the humic fraction of the soil and they don't show up on the soluble analysis. They're there and they're, they're accessible by living organisms, but they're not soluble. If they were soluble, it would wash away and the ocean would have all the nutrients on the planet. You don't really want to have your nutrients in a soluble condition in the soil because they wash away. What you really want to have in a fertile soil is you want to have your nutrients be in an insoluble but available form. Now that's a no-brainer. Hosting, everyone knows this, but they ignore it and say stupid things. And so they say, oh, legumes fix nitrogen, but they don't. It's the microbes living in the nodules that they're hosting on their roots that fix the nitrogen. And when you get your nitrogen fixing processes working properly in the soil, they won't nodulate anymore. There will be enough free lime in the soil that's been freed up by the growth of the legumes. This happens in Lucerne about its third year. It stops nodulating because the nitrogen fixation in the soil around it, the free fixing nitrogen microorganisms, take over from the ones in the nodules and it stops nodulating. So the microbiome is not working anymore. No, that's right. The azotobacters take over in their place. And then, and then if you're just measuring the nitrogen fixation in the nodules, you say that the lucerne went negative in its nitrogen fixation, but it didn't. It never fixed any nitrogen to begin with. It never had nodules. Well, no, it had nodules because it had nodules because that was the only place that nitrogen fixing microbes could live in that soil was yes. where this plant that released the lime and took it up into the plant sap and fed it to these microbes in its nodules, that's where it had the conditions to fix nitrogen. But once that developed far enough down the track, because the lucerne is going to release four to six times as much lime as it's used in fixing nitrogen in its nodules. And so as it does this throughout its life cycle, then it produces a lot more biologically active lime in the soil, and at some point the azotobacters and azosporilla and whatever will take over, and they're more efficient than the ones in the nodules.